Nothing is lost, nothing is created, everything is transformed. This sentence from Lavoisier, a 18th century French chemist, summarizes the law of conservation of mass. In other words, for any system, close to all transfers of matter and energy, the mass of the system must remain the same, constant over time, as the system mass cannot change, so quantity can either be added or removed. This mass balance principle sits at the heart of material flow analysis and, as you will see, is essential for measuring material flows, their associated environmental impacts, and this can be done at the scale of companies, cities, regions, or even countries. This accounting technique is essential to know because it sits at the heart of topics such as circular economy, climate change policies, urban metabolism, donut economics, life cycle assessment, and much more. Hi, I'm Aristide from Metabolism of Cities, and in this video you will learn what material flow analysis is, uh, how it is being used through some examples, as well what are the insights you can extract from such an analysis. With all that being said, let's dive deeper um, and let me illustrate what material flow or MFA is uh, by showing some slides. The first question you might be asking yourself is, what is material flow analysis? According to Brunner and Rechberger, material flow analysis is a systematic assessment of the flows and stocks of materials within a space defined in space and time. So if we look at this system over here, we have drawn some system boundaries and we're looking at everything that enters the system in terms of flows, stays within the system in terms of stocks, but also um, moves between processes. Now, I have to unpack this because there are many um, concepts that I have just introduced and that are important to be further elaborated. For instance, I talked about system boundaries. What is a system boundary? Well, an MFA system or a material flow system um, is this combination of a couple of things. First of all, the material flows, so the arrows you have here in the diagram of the stocks, so whatever stays within your system for more than a year, let's say, and the processes uh, that are the subsystem of your system, if you will. Here I have the box P and the box C, and these are, let's say, production and consumption. So you have imports going to production, from production goes to consumption, from consumption we have exports, but also perhaps recycling that goes back to production. So you have your processes, the boxes, the flows, the arrows, and the stocks, which are flows that stay within your system for more than your defined uh, time boundary. Now, what is your time boundary or your system boundary? The system boundary is this dotted lines box around everything. So this system boundary is, let's say, a boundary that you define of what is measured, what is included in your system, and what is excluded from your system. You define the system boundary both in space and time. So for instance, here, if you, if you see, I said that the system boundary is uh, EU 28, well, now 27, and it dates for 2018. So that's the year of reference I'm looking at. It, you, you could choose a country, a city, or even some virtual limits, such as a company, which can be spread around the globe, because, of course, not all operations are um, carried out in the same country. It can also be a household. Now that we've defined what is an MFA system, let's define what is a process. So if you remember in the previous graph, these boxes, the production on the one hand, the consumption on the other. So to better define what a process is, you have to think of it, it's a transformation or a storage of a flow from one state to another. So for instance, a, a wastewater treatment plant, so it receives uh, wastewater, uh, it's, it takes all of the the phosphorus and um, the nitrogen out of it, let's say, and then it releases it back to um, a stream or a river or something like that. The same thing with a waste incineration process. It receives, let's say, uh, municipal solid waste, it burns it, um, it produces, uh, once again, vapor that transforms into electricity, and then on the other hand you have, um, you know, ashes um, and and other, you know, uh, downgraded materials that you want to, to landfill at the end of it. So that is a process. Now, how about stocks? We, we said that um, we have processes, flows, and stocks. 
stocks is, as I mentioned, more or less um, a flow that does not move for the period of time that you're looking at your system. So for instance, if I'm doing a material flow analysis for one year for a country, a, um, a stock is whatever doesn't move for more than a year. So this can be a car, this can be a house, this can be your computer or your phone, you're looking at it. Um, so it's any type of reservoir or buffer, material buffer, that stays within your system for more than a certain quantity of time. And these stocks can remain constant over time, they can increase or decrease. So increase whenever we do constructions, for instance, uh, new constructions, new uh, homes, new infrastructures, uh, buying durable goods. And on the other hand, it can also decrease or deplete. Uh, so for instance, it can we can demolish, we can mine, um, or we can throw to waste. And as you can see here in the image, we have flows entering our system, so the 10 tons per year, another 5 tons going out, and because of uh, the material balance, we need to have 5 tons that stay within our system. And these are added to their stock, which is already uh, 750 tons for that year. On the flip side, we can have a depletion of stock, so the stock gets uh, smaller and smaller. And so this time we have 5 tons entering our system, 5 tons being released from our stock, uh, such as waste, and then exit our system, we have the 5 entering plus the 5 uh, exiting from our stock, uh, adding to 10 tons per year. So stocks can be of two nature, they can be natural and man-made stocks or anthropogenic stocks. So the natural or geogenic stocks, well of course it can be a query uh, so that, that you can get uh, gravel, you can get sand, but you can also get metal ores, um, you can get oil, gas, many other um, primary or raw materials. You can also get um, surface water or groundwater. So these are let's say the, the natural stocks. And their concentration of course may vary, so we can have uh, very concentrated stocks and the more we, we use them, the less concentrated it gets, so the more money we need to, to put and the more energy we need to put in order to extract these ores or these raw materials. So that's why we were discussing more and more about anthropogenic stocks, man-made stocks, or material urban stocks. So as you can see in the image, of course, this can be buildings, infrastructures, wires, uh, so metals, it can be uh, non-metallic minerals, so the bricks, the, the concrete, the sand, the gravel, it can be metals, it can be plastics, it can be wood, it can be many different things that we include in our territory for more than a year. Of course a man-made stock does not mean that we can use it as we want, it has to be technically feasible, it has to be economically feasible as well in order to facilitate the reuse of materials from the man-made stock. So we've discussed about the system boundary, the processes, the stocks, and now finally the flows. Well the flows are materials, and materials can be of, uh, of different nature, it can be substances, molecules, it can be goods or services that flow from one process to another. So it can be from a mine to a manufacturing plant to um, a household or to let's say a supermarket and then to a waste collection process and then to a waste treatment process. You have different processes or different boxes and then you have arrows that link them through materials. In general, we measure that with a unit of mass, so it can be tons, it can be kilograms, it can be kilotons sometimes, so thousands of tons, sometimes gigatons, so billion of tons, uh, and this is per year of course because that's the, the, the interval of time that we're looking at uh, our system boundary. So Brunner and Rechberger in their uh, in their book called Practical Handbook of Material Flow Analysis, they also differentiate two things. First of all, they say that a flow entering a process is an input, a flow exiting a process is an output, but also you can have imports and exports, so meaning things that come from outside of your system boundary and go outside of your system boundary. So if, if we have here Switzerland as a system boundary, 
whatever comes from outside of Switzerland into Switzerland, that's an import. And then what leaves Switzerland is an export. But then if you have a process here, let's say agriculture, well, this is both an import and an input. But if from agriculture it goes to households directly, then that's just an input. It's not an import. It's just a you know a, a jargon or a terminology that that they think is important to to underline. You know, in, in practice, it, it doesn't it doesn't have uh, much of implications. So we've seen what are the different components of a material flow analysis. We're looking at a system boundary. We have to draw a system boundary geographically and in time. We have to define what are the processes that we're looking at, and therefore what are the flows, the stocks that are interlinking these processes. And then once we have all of this, we can start doing a material flow analysis. In a different video, we have already explained some of these steps of a material flow analysis, but if I have uh, if I have to go quickly through them, you have five main steps whenever you're doing a material flow analysis. First of all, you define your system, as I mentioned. So you have to define, first of all, what is the question that you're trying to answer? Because any material flow analysis, you do it to answer a question. Because anyone can decide an arbitrary, let's say, sets and subsets of processes that you want to include in your system, right? Uh, after all, it's up to, to, to you to decide what you want to include and exclude. However, we generally include everything uh, needed in order to answer a question. So for instance, uh, what would be the impact of recycling in, let's say, uh, glass consumption within a country? Uh, how would it uh, reduce imports, exports, and waste if we recycled more? That's a defined question. Based on that, we will have a system that, well, a system boundary, so space and time, but also a selection of processes and flows that reflect, that can help us answer that question. Once we have this system definition, step two is you collect the flows and stocks needed to do a material flow balance, right? In some cases, you have some uncertainties, right? Uh, over there, you can look at reports into estimates and all of that. And whenever you don't have estimations or uh, characterizations via technical reports or academic uh, literature, you can calculate uh, these by general equations. So because you know that your system needs to be in balance, per process you need to have uh, an equality between what comes in what goes out and what stays in, in your stock. So you have a bunch of um, equations. If you manage to solve them, then you have your, your system that is balanced. Once you do that, you then illustrate your material flow analysis by what we call a Sankey diagram. And we have two videos explaining what is a, uh, a Sankey diagram, but also how to make one. So I'll refer to them in the description below, but also you can find them on our YouTube channel. Once you have illustrated your flows, you can start interpreting your material flow analysis. What does it mean? What is the main source of uh, flows? Where do they come from? What is the, the relationship between what we extract locally and what we import? Are we an um, import-dependent country or an export-dependent country? Are most of our emissions due to local uh, production or uh, because of it, we import stuff that, that have associated uh, uh, environmental effects elsewhere? So over there, you start interpreting your results, your quantities, and in step five, you can start doing recommendations in order to optimize or change your system. That goes back to step one, which is the problem definition. For instance, uh, the example of um, glass recycling. Well, what can we do to optimize the system? Should we increase recycling? Should we change waste regulations? Where do we act within this system diagram? And these are the, fa uh, the five main steps for doing an MFA. But to summarize why we do a material flow analysis, well, a material flow analysis is a very powerful tool because it, an, it can help us detect early harmful and useful uh, material accumulations within our system. So for instance, uh, there is a lot of metals 
or heavy metals that are accumulated in water reservoirs. Uh, there is a lot of uh, lead, for instance, in painting, and we need to change the type of, uh, of painting because we can predict how much lead is gonna is gonna accumulate in in our homes we can also start identifying the need of action so if we know that there is an early detection of toxic materials then we can start saying okay we should uh, develop policies for resource waste uh, and environmental policy management another way to do it is to evaluate the effectiveness of current and planned measures so let's say that your city your country or your company develops policies or measures in order to decrease your environmental impact or your footprint, let's say. Well, by doing a material flow analysis, you can test this. You can make scenarios saying, okay, let's imagine that we increase 10% of recycling in our company. Where would that, what would that change? How much would we reduce flows elsewhere? And what would be the environmental effect associated to this? Finally, one of the purposes of doing a material flow analysis is to design new type of products and have them ecologically optimized. Uh, products, processes as well. So over there you can start thinking, okay, I want this function from a product, a service or a process. What is the best way I could materially ener uh, energy and water optimize it in terms of flows? This is typically one of the use cases of material flow analysis. Now, let me give you a theoretical example just before a practical example, uh, and then we're going to wrap this up. So here we have an example of uh, this famous example of glass recycling. So over here we have two processes, production and consumption. We have four flows. This one, the import going to production, the sale going from production to consumption, the, the waste going from consumption being exported outside of the city, and then you have recycling going from, from consumption back to production. And depending on if you want your system to be static or dynamic, you also take into account the change rate of your stocks. So over here, if uh, the, the, the stock of the production increases or decreases, the stock of the consumption increases or decreases. This is typically one easy way to, to make a material flow diagram with your system boundary, your processes over here, your flows, four main flows, and then your stock if it's increased or decreased. Um, let me now show you a real a real life example where you can see how, how this has been done. So not too long ago, we collaborated on, on working on the London food footprint. And over there, we looked at Greater London, so the metropolitan area of London, and we looked at the mass of food flows entering, exiting, and being transformed within the metropolitan area of London. What can we see here? So for instance, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different processes, and we have flows connecting them, right? Going inside and out of them. And here in, in, in red, we see the greenhouse gas emissions. I'll, I'll omit them uh, just for a moment. Let's focus on the green parts on the green flows. So we see, for instance, that we have a number of flows uh, that go to, to manufacturing, and some of them are imported, or most of them, should I say, and some of them are locally harvested. From uh, manufacturing or producing locally, you have some parts that are waste over here or losses, and the main, the majority of it going to, to processing, uh, to retail, sorry, wholesale and retail. From there, some of them are exported uh, and most of them are consumed either within households or uh, in, um, in restaurants, uh, canteens and other places. And finally, uh, from the consumption of these flows, they go to waste and either they're um, their waste, uh, they're collected uh, locally or they're redistributed to, to other parties. And then from waste collection, they're treated by different, uh, by different uh, means of uh, waste treatment. So this is a synthetic image of the, the food footprint of London. What does it tell us? It tells us that, of course, most 
of, of flows that are needed for uh, the consumption of food in London are imported. And some of them, or half of them are imported locally uh, from other, uh, you know, UK regions. Other are, uh, and the other half is imported from uh, the rest of the EU and the world. That's one bit. We also see that there is uh, losses in your system here and there. We also see that the majority of food is consumed locally. And we see that the majority of, of waste is treated uh, in incineration. So over here, it's a quick synthetic overview of how a system works. In, in this case, it's a city, but it could be a country, it can be a company, and it helps you in, in one glance to understand what, what are the proportions and what we should be doing within this system. So for instance, here, we could say we need to absolutely reduce the imported uh, food uh, flows by increasing um, local production in order to increase the resilience of the system, in order to uh, decrease, let's say, the, the greenhouse gas emissions emitted to the imports, um, in order to better control the, the quality of the jobs from people working in agriculture and, uh, and, and, and other stuff. We could also start thinking, okay, we need to have more jobs in, in manufacturing, right? Uh, or in processing. So it really helps us to have a look, um, for instance, over here, we could say there is a lot of loss or food uh, waste going from wholesale and retail. We should work on this one as well. Uh, it really helps you very rapidly to, to think about solutions once you see the entire picture. We could also say, well, perhaps it's, it's a nonsense to have incineration because we're burning, you know, water in a sense uh, most of the organic mass uh, within uh, food waste is water so we're heating up water perhaps we could compost it and reuse it back to um, local production here perhaps we could make biogas and then use it for energy etc etc so all of these synthetic material flow analysis helps you to to better understand how a system works better understand what, what are your levers of, of action and of change, but also to identify where should we change anything? What are the main sectors? What are the main actors that I should activate in order to change my system? So if I have to synthesize what we have learned, first of all, material flow analysis is an essential analytical tools that helps us to have a systemic analysis for Syst uh, cities, companies, uh, uh, economic sectors to reduce their environmental effect and their footprint. Now, if you have any questions, comments, or if you would like any other videos, please leave them down below in the comments and we will see you in the next video. Cheers.